there are certain questions that keep science geeks lying awake at night, like what happened before the Big Bang? Can we ever come up with one unified model for physics? And when will we finally find those darn gravitational waves? Of course, that last question, at least, was finally put to rest earlier this year. Physics fans can sleep a little easier. But the question still remains, what does it all mean? When you strip away the math and the equations, what does any of this tell us about where we came from? Does the cosmos reveal anything about human nature? My next guest tackles these big questions in his new book, The Big Picture, on the origins of life, meaning, and the universe itself. Sean Carroll, you should know him by now. He's been on Science Friday quite a number of times. He's a theoretical physicist at uh, California Institute of Technology, author of the new book, The Big Picture. Welcome back, Sean. Thanks, Ira. Why, Why did you decide to write this book? Well, uh, in some sense, this is a book that I've been contemplating writing for my whole life, or at least for quite a fraction of it. I've always been one who believed that physics is fun, the big questions of the ultimate nature of reality are fun, but it also is the same universe that we're talking about when we do philosophy or biology or neuroscience. All of these things have to fit together somehow, and so this is my opportunity to see how that happens. You you coined a term called poetic naturalism. That's your perspective on how physics, science, humanities, nature, everything comes together. Uh, is that what you're talking about here, poetic naturalism? Yeah. Naturalism is the idea that there's one world, the natural world, and poetic reminds us that there are many ways of talking about the natural world. So even though the world is made of particles and forces at the deep level of physics, it's okay to talk about tables and chairs as real existing things, even though they're made of atoms. And in the same way, it's okay to talk about human beings making choices and judging things right and wrong. Uh, you know, when you when you talk about where we all come from, people have a religious bent to that. Is, did you include religion in this category? Well, I, in, I talk about it. I'm personally not religious. So I try to put forward naturalism as an alternative that where you can mm -hmm. really understand and think about questions of meaningfulness uh, from a naturalistic perspective. And I'm very happy if that's a conversation with people who come from other perspectives. Yeah. One, one of the first ideas you learn about in physics class is the Big Bang. And you say that the Big Bang is most likely not even a real event. Well, what I say is that we don't have any idea what happened at this purported moment of the Big Bang. Cosmologists, including some of my best friends, and even including me, sometimes exaggerate a little bit about what it means. We say the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe. Talking about what happened before the Big Bang is like talking about what was north of the North Pole. But all of that is not something we understand. These are just hypotheses. These are speculations. It's very possible there was something before the Big Bang. So we should be a little bit humble where we're saying what exactly was it that went on at that moment. Now Fred Hoyles cr created that term, didn't he, many years ago? To... He did. He was trying to make fun of the Big Bang idea. Of, of course, the Big Bang model, which is really what Hoyle was making fun of, is the general idea that the universe has been expanding from a hot, dense, early state. And that's 100% true. That we've established as correct. But the Big Bang event, the moment, the uh -huh. singularity at the beginning is something we don't understand. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a time, as a, a reference time that we can use. Exactly. It's sort of the time at which we no longer understand what the universe was doing. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm, you are. <laughs> but, I mean, isn't that what, we're, what, what we think physics and physicists are all about, is understanding what was going on then? I mean, it is, that... but you know, our understanding on the basis of data and observations does stretch back to one second after the Big Bang, right. uh, and we're now 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. So we've got a lot of it covered, that, that first second we're still working on. It, is, is physics then in trouble because we don't know what happened then at that moment, or, or a lot of other things that are going on in the universe, like dark energy? Do we need new physics, <laughs> new understanding? Physics is not in trouble because there are still interesting physics questions to be asked. That I mean, physics would be in trouble if we were done, right? I mean, yeah. that would be that would be bad for the physics departments. We would all change into engineering or, or biology departments. So physics is as healthy as you could imagine it being. Mm -hmm. Our number eight four four seven two four eight two five five. You can also tweet us at uh, SciFry S C I F R I. If you're just joining us, we're talking with uh, Sean Carroll, author of The Big Picture on the Origins of Life, Meaning, 
and the universe itself. Just just the title, Sean, is like... It's outrageous, isn't it? Outlandish. <laughs> How dare anyone write all of these things? So I, I hurry to point out that yeah. even though... I'm writing about these topics. I do not actually say how life began, how the universe began, or what the meaning of life is. I talk about how to talk about them. We don't know the answers to these questions yet. Mm -hmm. Do we need all? Do we need input from all different places, from all different um, ideas about life? Uh, to, well, I think, to understand this? Yeah, I mean, I think they all fit together, and, and th thinking about how they fit together is illuminating and informative. I'm, I'm very quick to say, if you want to be a good biologist, you don't need to study particle physics. That's not really very helpful. On the other hand, if your theory of biology is somehow incompatible with what we know about particle physics, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. There's an idea called core theory. It has gravity tacked onto the standard model. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, you know, again, if you listen to popular explanations of physics, you'll often hear it pointed out that we don't yet have a complete theory of quantum gravity, that the rules of quantum mechanics, which are so successful in the microscopic realm of atoms and particles, haven't yet been extended to include gravity. On the other hand, what that really means is that we don't understand everything about quantum gravity. We don't understand the Big Bang or black holes. But we do actually understand quantum gravity in weak gravitational fields, which includes the entire solar system, for that matter. So there's no problem in doing quantum gravity and including gravity in our best theories of physics here in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the phones. Some interesting questions. Let's go to Gainesville, Florida. Hi, Joe. Welcome to Science Friday. Joe, while you're there. Yes. Hi, go ahead. Yes, I like to ask, what does time play into this scenario, and uh, how does infinity and our own mortality uh, make us think about physics? All right, Good. time. Oh, that's <laughs> we don't have nearly enough time to answer these questions. You know, time is important. It certainly exists and plays in a role in our everyday lives in the evolution of the universe. We don't necessarily understand what it is as, at a fundamental level. You mentioned infinity. One of the things we don't know is whether the universe lasts for an infinite amount of time or a finite amount of time. But you also mentioned our mortality. One of the things we do understand is our lives last for a finite amount of time. The average mm -hmm. human lifetime is 3 billion heartbeats. And that's not such a big number. I think that you know, we should take all of one of those, every one of those heartbeats to be a very special thing. I could swear I remember in a past conversation you telling me that physicists don't believe there is such a thing as time. No, I never said that. Never I'm certainly said that. that I never said that. Okay. People say it all the time, and I make fun of them for saying that. So I think there is time. Otherwise, how would I have known when to be here for this interview? Well, um, you know, we were talking We were talking a little bit uh, earlier uh, about um, spooky action at a distance, which, mm -hmm. is, uh, which is another hair-curling idea. And the fact that how can, two, how can you have two entangled particles knowing each other is what they're doing, and that's because there's no distance or time between them in that's some right. other dimension. So we, we, we don't know. These are great questions that we're thinking about right now. I mean, time exists. There's no question about that. But the question is, does it exist like in the same way that electrons exist, that they're really part of the fundamental ingredients of reality, or does it exist like tables and chairs exist, that they're sort of useful approximations in certain regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, physicist John Wheeler, I remember meeting him many years ago when I was a young uh, journalist uh, talking about um, quantum mechanics, and he said that the reason that the universe exists is, that be is because we're here to observe it. Well, you it's, know, it's a, it's a free country. People can say whatever they want. But, it's uh, the anthropic principle, I think, it was at that time. I think uh, I actually have a position that is even less popular than that one, which is that there's no such thing as the reason the universe exists. I uh -huh. think that reasons why certain things are true or false are always relative to some context. You know, the reason why I uh, was tired this morning is because I didn't have my cup of coffee. But the universe, if the universe is everything then there's no context in which we find it. And we might need to be able to accept the idea that there isn't any such thing as the reason why the universe exists. It just, it just happens to be here. Yeah, it's just the kind of thing that happens now and again, mm -hmm. the universe. Mm -hmm. is, is physics uh, really coming, uh, coming uh, up with a 
larger ideas about the natural universe, or is it really just mapping out our own brain and consciousness? Well, yeah, that's you, that's a dichotomy that people sometimes put forward. Uh, idealism versus realism, right? Is the right. world a physical thing that is out there, or is it all just a, a projection of some ideas or some thoughts? I honestly, I've tried, I've spent time, I cannot wrap my brain personally around what it would mean for the universe to just be a thought or an idea. For me, as a physicist who makes up theories and compares them against the data, I like to think the real world actually exists. And do you think that we're going to be able to unite gravity and all the other forces and come up oh, with yeah. that? Yeah, there's no question. Yeah, it will happen uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. We're working on it. And, and what's your opinion on string theory? Has it run its course and is core theory going to take its place? Oh, no, the core theory is sort of the pedestrian part of quantum field theory, the part that we already understand, the part mm. that has been established, whereas string theory is much more ambitious. It tries to answer that question I said we don't have the answer to, which is what is the complete theory of quantum gravity? I, I think that it's very possible that string theory is not the complete theory, but will help us get there by giving us some pin pointers, some hints as to what direction to move in. Mm -hmm. you, you've really been very ambitious, as you say, in writing this book. You've reached into all different areas, biology, metaphysics, chemistry, that really, I'm sure you did, you uh, had to go study up on. Were you a little hesitant to branch out? And I was. You know, it was enormous fun doing the research for this book because I got to knock on people's doors and uh, brilliant people, MacArthur Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners, were happy to talk to me. Uh, and I'm not an expert on chemistry, biology, neuroscience, philosophy, any of these things. But then again. I think that probably nobody is an expert in the world on all of these things all at once, so why not me is one way to look at it. Okay, let's go to the phones. Let's see if we can go to uh, Jeff in uh, Plano, Texas. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to Science Friday. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good talking to you, Sean and Ira. Um, I, Sean, I was wondering if you'd ever heard of, um, and, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but Roger Penrose, who I'm sure you're familiar with, once stated something about the human mind and its unique ability to, to be conscious thought was what gave structure or maybe just structure to the universe, I guess you could say, not in the grand scale structure of galaxies and stuff, but it, it gave the existence to the universe. Do you, do you have more information on that or is that something you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, I'm aware of ideas like this. For a long time, one of the things that we don't understand in physics is the deep-down rules of quantum mechanics, right? We know that quantum mechanics works at the microscopic level. We can put it to use. We can make predictions. But there's still the question of what is it fundamentally saying. And for a long time, people were really taking seriously the possibility that there was some deep connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness because part of the textbook rules of quantum mechanics put a special emphasis on what happens when an observation occurs. Now, increasingly over the years, that has become less and less popular. We figured out how to deal with quantum mechanics in more traditional ways that make no special reference to the human observer. But there are still a few holdouts, like Roger Penrose, probably the most respectable and famous among them, who really think that you need consciousness to explain quantum mechanics and vice versa, quantum mechanics to explain consciousness. I think it's probably not the way to go. It's certainly declining in popularity rather than gaining. But, you know, as long as we don't know the answers, all options are on the table. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. In case you just joined us, we're talking with Sean Carroll, author of uh, this great big new book, uh, The Big Picture on the Origins of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. It, it, it's it's going to take a few more than a couple of days to <coughs> read this book, and then you're going to want to read it again because there are a lot of interesting uh, ideas in here. Uh, what uh, what was the most difficult part about writing this book for you, Sean? Oh, that's a very good question. You know, I think that there there's two obvious answers. One is that there's chemistry in the book, and I don't know anything about <laughs> chemistry. I mean, I know more about biology than I know about chemistry, and so like now I know what an ATP molecule is and what a fatty bilipid is and things like that. So you're ahead that of was, me. That, yeah, you know, that was fun, and I uh, I don't know if I'll still remember it a year from now, but I, I knew it when I was writing the book. But the other was, you know, there are people I disagree with uh, about deep issues about the nature of reality, and I wanted to give them a fair shake in the book. I wanted to represent their own views fairly rather than just sort of caricaturing what they believed. So I put a, a decent amount of effort into being fair and getting straight how people would have 
put forward their own views and hope, mm -hmm. even though if I disagree with them, I hope they won't think that I'm just uh, making straw men out of their positions. Mm -hmm. uh, physicist Frank Wilczek, who, uh, who very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, talking about the core theory, said that in the future, rather than talking about physics in terms of energy, someday the laws of physics will be rewritten in terms of information and its transformation. Is, is everything just information? Well, everything is the universe. Everything is the stuff the universe is. But maybe the best way to talk about the universe is in terms of its information contained in different little parts of it. Uh, in particular, if you really believe that quantum mechanics is the right underlying theory of the world, there's this wonderful burgeoning growing field of quantum information where we really describe different parts of the universe in terms of how much information about one part is reflected in what's going on in some other part. That's the, that's the miracle of entanglement and the spooky action at a distance. Uh, I'm actually working on finishing a paper right now where we use ideas from quantum information and mutual information between different parts of the universe to model quantum gravity in a simple way. So, yeah, I think that's one of the possible ways things can go. Of course, we'll have to see how it happens. Is, is, is the quantum uh, limited? Is there something beyond quantum physics? Is it a subset of something we haven't discovered yet? Well, I don't know. That would be great. I mean, that's, that's the kind of exciting possibility that it's thrilling to think about. But right now, there's literally no indication from any experiment, whether thought experiment or real experiment, that something like that must be true. So we're free to think about it, but it, as long as nature is giving us zero guidance in that direction, the safe bet is just to still work within the quantum mechanical framework. Well, it's a safe bet you're going to like the, uh, the the book that Sean has written, The Big Picture on the Origins of Life, Meaning, and the Universe Itself. Sean Carroll, research professor in the Department of Physics at California Institute, Caltech of Technology. Well, welcome, and thanks for, thanks for coming on today. Always great to be here, Iris. Our modern picture of our cosmos was painstakingly pieced together through data collected by astronomers, who frequently brought back results that defied conventional theoretical wisdom of the time. A century ago, in 1915, Albert Einstein put the finishing touches on his general theory of relativity, which conceives of space-time itself as a dynamic object whose curvature gives rise to the force we know as gravity. Before that point, it's safe to say that we knew next to nothing about what the universe was really like on large scales. Space-time was thought to be absolute and eternal, in accordance with Newtonian mechanics, and astronomers were divided on whether the Milky Way was the only galaxy in the universe, or merely one of countless many. Now the basics have been well established. The Milky Way we see stretching across the dark night sky is a galaxy a collection of stars orbiting under their mutual gravitational attraction, it's hard to count precisely how many, but there are over 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. It's not alone. Scattered throughout observable space we find at least 100 billion galaxies, typically with sizes roughly comparable to that of our own. By coincidence, the number 100 billion is also a very rough count of the number of neurons in a human brain. Recent studies of relatively nearby stars suggest that most of them have planets of some sort, and perhaps one in six stars has an Earth-like planet orbiting around it. Perhaps the most notable feature of the distribution of galaxies through space is that, the farther out we look, the more uniform things become. On the very largest scales, the universe is extremely smooth and featureless. There is no center, no top or bottom, no edges, no preferred location at all. Scatter all the material throughout space, and general relativity says that it's not just going to sit there. Galaxies are going to pull on one another, so the universe must be either expanding from a more dense state, or contracting from a less dense one. In the 1920s, Edwin Hubble discovered that our universe is indeed expanding. Given that discovery, we can use our theoretical understanding to extrapolate backward in time. According to general relativity, if we keep running the movie of the early universe backward, we come to a singularity at which the density and expansion rate approach infinity. That scenario, developed by Belgian priest George Lemmy circumflex accent under the name the primeval atom but eventually dubbed the Big Bang model, predicts that was the early universe was not only denser but also hotter. So hot and dense that it would have been glowing like the interior of a star, and all of that radiation should still suffuse space today, ready for detection in our telescopes. That's just what happened in the fateful spring of 1964.
when astronomers Arno Pencius and Robert Wilson at Bell Laboratories detected the cosmic microwave background radiation, leftover light from the early universe that has cooled off as space expanded. Today it is just a bit less than 3 degrees above absolute zero, it's a cold universe out there. When we talk about the Big Bang model, we have to be careful to distinguish that from the Big Bang itself. The former is an extraordinarily successful theory of the evolution of the observable universe, the latter is a hypothetical moment that we know almost nothing about. The Big Bang model is simply the idea that approximately 14 billion years ago the matter in the universe was extremely hot, densely packed, and spread almost uniformly through space, which was expanding very rapidly. As space expanded, matter diluted and cooled and stars and galaxies condense out of the smooth plasma under the relentless pull of gravity. Unfortunately, the plasma was so hot and dense at early times that it was essentially opaque. The cosmic microwave background reveals what the universe looked like when it first became transparent, but before that, we cannot directly see. The Big Bang itself, as predicted by general relativity, is a moment in time, not a location in space. It would not be an explosion of matter into an empty, pre-existing void, it would be the beginning of the entire universe, with matter smoothly distributed all throughout space, all at once. It would be the moment prior to which there were no moments, no space, no time. It's also, most likely, not real. The Big Bang is a prediction of general relativity, but singularities where the density is infinitely big are exactly where we expect general relativity to break down they are outside the theory's domain of applicability. At the very least, quantum mechanics should become crucially important under such conditions, and general relativity is a purely classical theory. So the Big Bang doesn't actually mark the beginning of our universe, it marks the end of our theoretical understanding. We have a very good idea, on the basis of observational data, what happened soon after the bang. The microwave background radiation tells us to a very high degree of precision what things were like a few hundred thousand years afterward, and the abundance of light elements tells us what the universe was doing when it was a nuclear fusion reactor, just a few minutes afterward. But the bang itself is a mystery. We shouldn't think of it as the singularity at the beginning of time it's a label for a moment in time that we currently don't understand. Ever since the expansion of the universe was discovered, the question of the future fate of the universe has preoccupied the minds of cosmologists. Would it keep expanding forever, or eventually reverse course, contracting down to an ultimate big crunch? A major clue was uncovered just as the 20th century was ending, when in 1998 two teams of astronomers announced that the universe wasn't only expanding, it was accelerating. If you focused on a particular faraway galaxy and measured its velocity, then came back a few million or billion years later and measured it again, you would find that it's now moving away from you even faster. That's not what the astronomers did, of course, they compared the velocities of galaxies at different distances. If this behavior continues forever which seems quite plausible the universe will continue to expand and evolve in perpetuity. Normally we'd expect the expansion of the universe to slow down as the gravitational forces between the galaxies work to pull them together. The observed acceleration must be due to something other than matter as we know it. There is a very obvious, robust candidate for what the culprit might be, vacuum energy, which Einstein invented and called the cosmological constant. Vacuum energy is a kind of energy that is inherent in space itself, remaining at a constant density amount of energy per cubic centimeter even as space expands. Due to the interplay of energy and space of time in general relativity, vacuum energy never runs out or fades away it can keep pushing forever. We don't know for sure whether it will keep pushing forever. Of course, we can only extrapolate our theoretical understanding into the future. But it's possible, and in some sense would be simplest, for the accelerated expansion to simply continue without end. That leads to a somewhat lonely future for our universe. Right now the night sky is alive with brightly shining stars and galaxies. That can last forever, stars use of their fuel and will eventually fade to black. Astronomers estimate that the last dim star will wing out around 1 quadrillion 10-15 years from now. By then other galaxies will have moved far away, and our local group of galaxies will be populated by planets, dead stars, and black holes. One by one, those planets and stars will fall into the black holes, which in turn will join into one supermassive black hole. Ultimately, as Stephen Hawking taught us, 
even those black holes will evaporate. After about one good all 10,100 years, all of the black holes in our observable universe will have evaporated into a thin mist of particles, which will grow more and more dilute as space continues to expand. The end result of this, our most likely scenario for the future of our universe, is nothing but cold, empty space, which will last literally forever. We are small, and the universe is large. It's hard, upon contemplating the scale of the cosmos, to think that our existence here on Earth plays an important role in the purpose or destiny of it all. That's just what we see, of course. For all we know, the universe could be infinitely big, or it could be just a bit larger than what we observe. The uniformity that characterizes our observable region of space could extend on indefinitely, or other regions could be extremely different from our own. We should be modest when making pronouncements about the universe beyond what we can measure. One of the most striking features of the universe is the contrast between its uniformity in space and its dramatic evolution over time. We seem to live in a universe with a pronounced temporal imbalance, about 14 billion years between the Big Bang and now, and perhaps an infinite number of years between now and the eventual future. To the best of our knowledge, there's a legitimate sense in which we find ourselves living in a young and vibrant period in the universe's history a history that will mostly be cold, dark, and empty. Why is that? Maybe there's a deeper explanation, or maybe that's just how it is. The best a modern cosmologist can do is to take these observed features of the universe as clues to its ultimate nature, and keep trying to put it all into a more comprehensive picture. The crucial question along the way is, why did the matter in the universe evolve over billions of years in such a way as to create us?